Oh, hello there, and welcome to Phil Talking D20. So, today's video is an odd one because we're going to kind of ask some fundamental questions about what Pathfinder 2 is. Now, most people are going to be fairly confident and they're going to be able to kind of go, well, it's a magical fantasy role playing game. And yes, they're quite correct. But what if it's also a steampunk game? What? Yeah. So this is like a travel log series um, where we're going to look at some of the more, I suppose, different regions that dwell within the Pathfinder core rulebook and are also dived into more detail in the Lost Omens World Guide because steampunk is a thing. And it's a thing in Core Pathfinder 2's own game world setting. And many people are going to be like, no, it's not. Because, like I said, the easy assumption is that Pathfinder 2 is, at its heart, simply a typical fantasy role-playing game set in a kind of semi-medieval fantasy land of magic and swords. And for the most part it is, but like I said, there are little hidden gems everywhere. And the Impossible Lands is one of those little cheeky gems. So the Impossible Lands, in a nutshell, are a, a number of countries uh, on one of the continents. And we're going to have a quick look in the World Guide, because there's a wonderful little map. And it talks us through um, the main kind of regions. So there's Nex. There's Geb, there's the Manor Wastes, there's a um, city-state called Alkinstar, and then there's the island nations of uh, Jamalri. If I'm pronouncing that right, I'm probably not. Uh, but Manor Wastes? Mm. So, if anyone is familiar with Eberron from the 5e setting... That's kind of a little bit like what they're doing with the Impossible Lands to an extent. Basically, the um, two nations of Nex and Geb um, are incredibly magic-infused, powerful, kind of superpower magic-based nations. Nex is um, a, a kind of a, a, a kind of a big country run by a uh, well formerly run by an incredibly powerful ancient probably sorcerer maybe a wizard and geb is an undead land ruled by a horrible and evil lich i assume he might i mean they reference him as a ghost in in some texts but he kind of sounds more like a lich and i think from a, a a kind of a fluff and flavor perspective i'd probably go with lich um and in Geb, they actually say that uh, alive people are a very tiny minority and the vast bulk of the population are undead, which is already very cool in its own right. Um, in the middle of those two nations, however, the manor wastes are literally an irradiated, blasted wasteland uh, that have been shattered by centuries of magical weapons of mass destruction. Yeah. Magical Weapons of Mass Destruction. WMDs! Um, they're everywhere. Um, turns out when we were looking for them in Iraq, they were in Pathfinder. Um, that's why we couldn't find them. So there's some really fascinating stuff in here. I mean, in the Manor Wastes, they talk about wild, uncontrollable magic. And they talk about areas that are magically dead. They are magically inert. So there's no magic there. And that as a concept is already quite interesting. Um, so there's going to be some homebrew uh, suggestions for how you can better reflect those places within your game world. If you chose to have a party start in or adventure to the impossible lands. Because like I said, if you're using the core world in your game and you have picked a starting location... Um, and they are operating in the normal gaming world, it's all there. Um, you know, the I mean, the Impossible Lands are just to the right of the Mwangi Expanse, uh, which is just below the Golden Road, um, and just across from Absalom, and then you've got Old Cheliax, and then you've got the Shining Kingdoms, and then you've got the Eye of Dread, and then you've got the Broken Lands, and then you've got the Saga Lands. So... It's well within striking distance, you know, it's not like it's 
oh, well, it's a completely different world, so my party will never, ever get there. It's not the case. If they're in this major landmass that is the core focus of, of Galorian in terms of rules, law, and fluff, when you look at the map in the core book, the impossible lands are right there. You can't ignore them, and a party doesn't have to ignore them. You know, if you're running uh, an open adventure path where players have more freedom and choice to make decisions and travel and, you, and you're not kind of pigeonholing them with, oh, we're doing this adventure path so you can't go anywhere else and you're doing a, a bit more of an open game, they can go there. And you could even start a campaign there because it's a fascinating place. So why is it a fascinating place? Well, we've touched on a few of those reasons. But the ones that really stand out are when they're talking about Alkenstar and the Manor Wastes and this kind of uncontrollable wild magic and these mutated beasts. So I'll just give you a little bit of flavour. Uh, the arcane wars between Nex and Geb were not kind to the surrounding regions, often reducing their captured territories to blasted wastelands where warped radiation prevented all magic from functioning. The nation of Alkenstar arose in such a uh, place beneath the shadow of the Dongan Hold, a dwarven sky citadel sealed by its former occupants to prevent it from becoming a prize handed back and forth between the two warring powers. Though the dwarves had abandoned their fortress more than a, a thousand years earlier, the surrounding ruins became a haven for a ragtag settlement of refugees and vagabonds. Um, when, uh, when a renegade engineer named Alkinstar fled from Nex to avoid criminal charges, he discovered the shattered ruins of the Dongan Hold and used his technology to fortify the settlement, bringing agriculture to its nearby plains and transforming the powerful Ustradi River into a literal engine of creation. Not content to live in the shadow of, mighty, of the mighty Donganhold, Alkenstar devised an ingenious method to open the Dwarven Sky Citadel and explore its many mysteries. He and his uh, followers eventually tracked down the missing dwarves themselves, who now resided in an isolated vault deep in the Darklands which is the Underdark, if you're familiar with 5e and you're not quite sure what I meant. Uh, but it's basically where the drow and all the other terrible things dwelleth. In Greek mythology, you would call it the Underworld, that place beneath our feet, deep down in the ground, uh, to give it a more cultural, historical reference. Um, da -da 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 -da. Um, a bargain between Alkenstar and the dwarves provided the fledgling city with a, dwarven in, uh, with a dwarven innovation perfected during the dwarves' time in the vault and destined to change the course of history. Firearms. That's right. Guns. These weapons ensured that the refugees would never again be caught defenceless in the battles between Nex and Geb, and over the last century the Grand Duchy of Alkenstar has grown into a powerful, if isolated, kingdom in its own right. While Nex still claims the settlement as a nominal vassal since uh, its armies were the last to claim Donganhold in the Age of Destiny before the Dwarves' retreat, no one takes this claim seriously outside the government halls of Quantinium. Alkenstar currently operates as an independent city-state with holdings that include Donganhold and the town of Martel. The city of Alkenstar itself stands atop the hell-fallen cliffs overlooking the narrow valley where the Ustradi River plunges hundreds of feet over the massive Alken Falls on its journey into Nex. A layer of soot covers most of Alkenstar's brick and iron buildings, but elegant brass decorations shining through the grim, the grime hint at the grand architecture beneath. Voluminous clouds of steam hang over the city and sometimes cover its streets, mixing with the thick fog banks drifting off the Estradi River and the acrid black smoke churning from the city's omnipresent factories. At the southeastern shore of Lake Estradi sits a massive castle. This castle is called the Gunworks, where metallurgists and engineers of Alkenstar labour to develop firearms technology. Their product, uh, their proudest achievement is a massive cannon known as the Great Moor of Rotherbug, an enormous bombard, which is basically a big, massive medieval mortar. Um, an enormous bombard with a range measured in miles uh, that is often used against the mutated giants of the manor wastes who raid the city nearly every summer. Massive mutated giants of death being shot at by a huge cannon. Is that classical kind of D&D-esque Pathfinder 
magical fantasy. No, what I've literally just described to you there is steampunk. So, yeah, Pathfinder 2 is steampunk, as well as everything else that it is, because it is a many talented and many stringed uh, individual when it comes to what it's offering and what it's bringing to the table. Um, so there are some timelines here in this section of the book, um, but that really gives us a pretty fundamental kind of, you know, sock on the chin when it comes to this concept of what Pathfinder 2 typically is considered to be, because that isn't typical at all. You know, that's steampunk and that's really cool. So um, having this kind of space within a world um, in these mana wastes is, 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 is pretty exciting. Um, and the mana wastes are crazy. Uh, they talk about winds of magic, uh, wild magic, uh, magical dead zones where there's no magic. Um, the artwork for these um, cannon wielding giants is crazy. They're like multi limbed Aztec mask wearing bronze cannon wielding giants of doom that have loads of eyes all over their body. Uh, because they've been horribly mutated by this kind of blasted, irradiated, magical wasteland. It's almost Mad Max, um, but like magical steampunk and giants with cannons. So not really Mad Max at all. But it's got that kind of a crazy apocalyptic vibe. Um, now, um, Let's just quickly have a quick dabble in some of the cool text from the Manor Wastes. From vast alchemical, uh, alchemical miasmas to chaotic eldritch storms uh, to the unquiet souls of annihilated armies, the Manor Wastes swirl with unpredictable dangers seen nowhere else on Glorian. Rife with carnivorous plants, shattered glass sandstorms and poisonous fogs, the landscape itself seems singularly dedicated to destroying those who attempt to traverse, um, to traverse or settle its tenacious wilderness. To the west is the sprawling region of dead magic, the Grand Duchy of Alkenstar. Um, and it provides the region's most secure sanctum, drawing not just refugees and escaped slaves and wanderers, but increasingly merchants from foreign um, nations eager to um, essentially trade and essentially buy guns. There's also dwarves reaching out to their lost kin that have been rediscovered. Um, those journeying to and from Alkenstar must endure not just the terrors of the Manor Waste's unnatural environment, but also the predations of the magic warped monstrosities who call the place home. Um, yeah, amazing. Just amazing. How how crazy does that sound as an environment to suddenly find yourselves gaming in? Now, it also sounds like probably quite a high threat, high challenge environment. So I'm not entirely convinced that it's possibly suitable for a level one kind of bunch of kind of atypical fantasy plebs who just go, oh, let's go walking through the matter ways and visit Alkenstar. Probably going to die because I'm not sure how from reading that. If you're going to be dealing with shattered glass sandstorms, toxic death clouds and um, horrible mutated kind of monstrous beasts and cannon wielding giants, that you're ever going to survive. Uh, but obviously you can. I think it's just one of those things where you'd have to go into a lot of world based role play prep to get the right caravan master and the right kind of trade routes that are guarded by armoured cannon wielding golems and all that kind of stuff to kind of help you cross these kind of wastelands it doesn't sound like the kind of place where you just think oh we'll just put a backpack on and get some camping gear and go for a wander and it'll be all be fine i don't think that's going to work um and i don't think it should work because it's important to keep the fluff and flavor in mind when thinking about balance and encounters what i've just read to you if you just walked across that at level one and the dm was just like Oh, um, oh, there's a toxic kind of death cloud of miasma. Make a fortitude save of nine. Oh, you take two points of damage. Oh, it's terrifying. It would suck, wouldn't it? You're not doing it justice. It needs to be dangerous, really dangerous, and, and, and kind of 
scary and 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 visceral to give it its full justice you know do it justice basically so don't pull punches with it and 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 make sure that if your players are wandering towards it benignly and not really thinking like that warn them you know have a local trader kind of be like you're gonna do what no you're gonna try and just walk into the manor waste without proper gear and and you know poke at them so that they don't just go and get themselves killed um that said don't make it impossible for them don't make it a place where they have to be like level 15 just to go for a walk you've got to find that balance and and be comfortable with it and i can't help you with that that's a personal thing um but having read that let's be honest a shattered glass sandstorm sandstorm sounds pretty damn unpleasant as does toxic gas miasmas and horribly mutated magical beasts um so yeah, tread carefully in the manor wastes. But what's waiting us for on the other side? If they make it to Alkenstar and you're a mage or a wizard, guess what? No magic, loser. Ugh, it's magically dead. Like, if you're confused about what the phrase magically dead might mean, get a dictionary. There's no magic there. That's why they rely on technology. That's why they made guns. Now... There aren't any guns in Pathfinder 2. There are some in Pathfinder 1, and you can have great fun homebrewing those or tinkering about with those or simply just pulling across um, the Pathfinder 1 guns and, and, and fudging them so they fit. Or you can just reflavor bows and crossbows and things and call them firearms. That's kind of... That was my first thought. I'd take things like crossbows and just call them guns if I was going to do a really quick kind of lazy conversion so that I had something gun-like and then you could get into uncommon or rare items and do things like revolvers which would be more like um, traditional um, multi-shot crossbows um, where you've got six shots before you have to do a two round uh, two action reload for example um, so again have a tinker about it's in the fluff you know, everything I'm reading to you is from the World Guide. And even in the Impossible Lands section in the Core Rulebook, they talk about guns. And they talk about um, these kind of, you know, ancient wars and these mana blasted kind of magical dead zones. So, if I was going to run this environment, how would I think about these eldritch storms and these... Um, areas of wild magic that they talk about in, in detail when you read the whole thing, because obviously I haven't read the whole thing, there's a lot of text here, but I've just kind of grabbed hold of some of the really, I suppose, enigmatic bits that are, I, I suppose, really just punching hard as to what it's about. So <clears throat> in the areas where magic is wild and out of control and unstable, there's a couple of options. Um, the first is um, simply saying that any success... Uh, with a spell is a critical success but then also any failure is a critical failure magic is wild and out of control don't be afraid to make it feel like it's wild and out of control if it's a magical dead zone there's no magic it's that simple just saying no you can't use any spells no your magic items are no longer magic until you leave this area and then they'll be revivified with the magics that they'll draw in from their magical surroundings it's just how it is you are dealing with something that's incredibly extreme. In their own words, they tell you that, that there is no other place like this on Galorian. It's, it's been had thousands of years of mad, 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 mad majors and wizards detonating endless fireballs and meteor strikes and all kinds of other kind of ridiculously high level spells and just turn the place into an absolute wasteland. Uh, other things you can consider uh, in areas where um, there is like high volumes of um, magical kind of instability um, and these winds of magic, you could um, in certain areas say that spells are per encounter instead of per day. So that these kind of tumultuous kind of winds of magic that are kind of pouring through a particular region are making spells easier to use and, and magic is kind of, you know, I suppose simply being regenerated and, and kind of imbued at a greater rate because of this increased magical instability. Um, another one you could use is you could cap spell levels. So you could have, 
leading into a dead zone, you could have it so that, say, for every couple of miles towards, a, you know, this particular dead zone, they lose a level of spell as almost like a warning. So that, say, you've got a, a caster who can cast six level spells and they start heading towards a magical dead zone. You could say, all right, well, now you've lost your highest level spell. And then if they keep traveling, you could be like, now you've lost access to that next down level of spells to the point where they're maybe only down to like i can only cast level two or level three spells because they're really close to one of these kind of magical dead zones and it's just rippling out and just sapping the magic out of them that is a really cool flavor for how you can obviously kind of reflect stuff that's going on in this world and again i think in nex and geb where there are these concentrations of incredibly powerful magisters and, 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 and mages and liches and wizards. Again, I'd look at things like in these lands, predominantly spells are always heightened. That's another rule you could use. Um, you know, all spells are maximized. All spells are heightened. Um, all spells are halved. Uh, if it was, again, something you were looking at for uh, what if they're in a particularly wild region? And you could create a little table and you could have these ideas written down on that table and then roll a D8 or a D10 and be like, um, winds of change are blowing, the magic winds are, are blowing, there's a storm blowing in, what kind of effect is it going to have on you as you travel? Roll the dice, uh, I've got a six, that is uh, all spells are heightened or um, all successes are crit successes, but all fails are crit fails. You can literally just have this, this chaos in magic around you. And, and have this little table and this little kind of role system going on to really get into the flavour of these kind of wild worlds. Firearms is, is going to be a big deal. You're going to have to do something with that. Um, and you're going to have to look at that from a perspective of, do you want guns to be powerful? Because there's no magic in Alkenstar, so they have to be, because it's what they've been using to survive without magic. So I think from a perspective of my initial lazy reaction of, oh, I'd probably just convert bows and crossbows. I'm not really sure that's good enough. So it might be worth making them um, two dice weapons, or even in some instances for like some really crazy, rare, uncommon, hard to get hold of higher level weapons. Because again, don't be afraid to come up with powerful weaponry and make it a higher level expensive item that you can't get hold of on low levels. But again, keep in mind, your damage dice progression. So one good way of balancing this would be to simply look at what level you get runes and what kind of cost runes work at. Uh, when we're looking at that, we're looking in uh, the kind of the, the, the magical equipment section. And let's just quickly flash to that so we can have a quick gandar. Now, from a perspective of um, plus one weapon potency rune, 35 gold. Uh, a plus one weapon, 35 gold. That's your plus one in your attack rolls. Um, let's have a quick look. Where do we get into that? I think they're fourth level, aren't they? Oh, yeah, here we are. Plus one striking weapon. A plus one striking weapon is 100 gold, and it's basically adding a damage dice. So a, a longsword is now 2d8 for 100 gold, as opposed to 1d8 for not 100 gold. If you're going to do something with guns, and you want them to be cool, don't be afraid to make them expensive because they're artisan crafted rare items. But again, don't be afraid to say that you can't put magic on them because they are made somewhere that's magically dead and magically inert, and maybe that lingers. So if you say um, made pistols a um, 100 gold and they were like steampunk revolvers and they did 2d8 damage, and had a range of say 40 feet and a reload of two uh, after six shots with uh, piercing damage um, as their, their kind of multiplier and a plus one on attack rolls, but not magical, have that as a, uh, a kind of an item bonus, non-magical item bonus, uh, and say that's 100 gold. Now, you could then have, say, um, a, a blunderbuss or a big kind of um, kind of slug rifle, and that could do bludgeoning, and that could be even more money because it could be the equivalent in cost to a plus two striking weapon, which is effectively 
So let's call that 3D10. That sounds really silly, but 3D10 is a plus two um, striking weapon. That's a thousand gold. Um, so we're we're now looking at that and we're saying, okay, so it's going to have 3D8 or 3D10, and it's going to do bludgeoning damage. But again, we're using the magical weapon costings for balance and the magical damage dice additioning system for balance so that they are the same as magical weapons and accessed in the same way at the same levels but they're not magical they're just really powerful guns and they can't be for purposes of properly sanity magic because they're made somewhere magically inert so don't be afraid to feel like you're being a bit crazy as long as you're staying within the framework that pathfinder 2 creates for you and then obviously remember that they're going to be fighting horribly irradiated, multi-limbed, magical giants with cannon. Yeah, that's why you should probably think about making guns pretty potent. There's no touch armor class. Don't look at Gunslinger and all the nonsense in the Pathfinder 1 Gunslinger where he makes all these range attacks against touch AC. That is a toxic class. I'm going to say it. It is. It's toxic. Don't go near it. You're going to have to do something with them, though, because there are going to be gunslingers. Now, let's hope and keep our fingers crossed that in a later edition, we see more fluff and flavor added to flavor out Alkinstar, because it is an amazing opportunity for steampunk adventuring and technology and equipment within your core Galorian Pathfinder 2 world. And we shouldn't ignore it. So I hope you have enjoyed this um, travel log, if you like, into the basics of Alkenstar and the basics of the Impossible Lands. Um, I'm probably going to do a follow-up video where I do a little bit more and I kind of talk a little bit about um, Geb and Nex and, and try and kind of get more into these kind of uh, these spaces. But hopefully that's given you enough of a taste to kind of get a feel for what you could do with magic to reflect these kind of wild magical winds of change and these dead zones where magic simply doesn't work and function. And again, these places where there are guns and technology like Alkenstar. Um, and also um, these kind of spaces where you've got these big, powerful lich based or undead, you know, wizard kind of caster based lands such as Nex and Geb and all this kind of other stuff. Drop me a like, drop me a subscribe. There's more content to come. I'm probably going to do a follow up video um, on this um, tomorrow, just kind of having a little bit more of a look at some of the really cool, unique stuff about Geb and Nex. Because the Mana Wastes and Alkenstar are kind of a big part, but obviously they are spawned from the wars between these two nations that I've lightly touched on. So I want to kind of talk about them, but they're, they're worthy of their own video. Um, so stay tuned. Drop me a like, drop me a sub, leave me some comments if you've got ideas about uh, what craziness you, you do with these multi-limbed, um, crazy, terrifying, cannon-wielding giants of death that storm the city of Alkenstar uh, every summer uh, and need to be blasted with a huge, massive mortar of death. Um, it's solid gold, isn't it? Let's be honest with you. Take care, stay safe, stay well, and I will catch you on the next one. Peace.